All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, Tuesday afternoon, and we're happy to be here with you today. Allison Skaberg here with Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, today, we are excited to be here again with Andy Hardwick with the Social Security Administration. Today, um, what we're going to be talking about going deep and wide with is work incentives and working while drawing benefits. Um, we had a webinar with Andy in the last couple of weeks where he um, went over uh, in detail all of the benefits that are available and applying for benefits, and we do have that uh, webinar on our YouTube channel. If you have missed that, I do invite you to, um, to, to listen to that one. It will be very well worth your time. Uh, Consolidated Planning Group, we are a special needs financial planning firm. Um, we offer a number of webinars uh, each week that are surrounding topics related to special needs planning and considerations that you might need to have on your radar um, as it relates to planning, transitioning, having money in the right buckets to maintain your eligibility for benefits and um, things of that nature. We do have a YouTube channel. I've put that in the chat box and we'll have that again at the end. So if you've missed some of these presentations or you want to go back and um, kind of cherry pick the ones that are most related uh, to you and your situation, you can definitely find that on our YouTube channel. Uh, having said that, uh, Andy, I am um, I am going to turn it over to you. I guess I should just go through a, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, today, we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. Your mics uh, and uh, your videos are muted, but we know you're here and we're glad you're here. We do want you to put your questions in the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring the chat box today. I'm going to read out um, those questions and we're going to get uh, as many answers to questions as we can during the time that we have. We're going from 12 to um, 12 to 1 today. We will be finished by 1 o'clock. So if you're on your lunch hour or, um, you know, kind of considering making considerations for that, uh, there is that. So having said that, Andy, we're all, um, all set and ready for you. And please take it away. Thank you for joining us again today. Thank you very much, Allison. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, everybody, for coming out today. My name is Andy Hardwick. I'm a public affairs specialist for Social Security here in Southeast Texas, and we are going to talk about work incentives today. Sometimes uh, parents are fearful when the, when the schools encourage their kids to enroll in transition programs to see if they can do some kind of work activity. You know, parents uh, get their kids on SSI, and then, they're, then the school district is pushing for the kids to go to to go to work and you know parents are fearful that by their kids working they are going to lose their benefits but that's not the purpose of the work incentive program the work incentive program is to provide employment support for those people that are able to do some kind of work and to try to get them away from benefit dependence and move them over to independence which means that for some people, the goal might be to eventually get off of disability programs and just be able to work and earn like everybody else and get the same benefits that everyone else does. Now, we know that that's not possible with everybody, depending on the degree of disability that a person might have. They might be able to go out in the workforce and eventually um, do a 40-hour a week job and things like that. But even if they can't, these these the work activity should provide them extra income that will supplement their uh, government benefits. Okay, so so again, these these programs are designed to see if if youth can do some kind of work activity, and uh, we're going to talk about these disability programs. We have two: what dis disability means for Social Security and what substantial gainful activity is. Okay, so disability means having a physical or mental condition that's gonna keep a person from working, from performing substantial gainful activity. It's a, it's, a, it's a condition, physical or mental, that has lasted or is expected to last at least 12 months. Now, this is the definition for anyone 18 or over. For under 18, it's different. It's comparing that child to other children of similar age. 
in the community in the community and to see you know, what kind of limitations they have as far as feeding themselves, dressing, clothing themselves, using the bathroom. But once they turn age 18, we then decide whether or not they're disabled using the adult standards. Okay, so we said, we said about uh, as far as a, a person not being able to engage in, in work activity, uh, it means that a person, a person would have to, uh, a person that's, that's disabled or has a disability and, um, and is working when they're applying for a disability benefit, okay? Uh, substantial gainful activity for us means 1310. Unfortunately, this is, I didn't realize this was an older slide or maybe it, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know, but it's talking about the person, their the gross earnings of $1,200 a month. Okay, and um, uh, if a person, if a person, the 1310 is the substantial gainful activity amount. So if a person is applying for, for social security or SSI disability and they are working, and they are earning over $1,310 per month gross, then we are, then Social Security says that that person is engaging in substantial gainful activity and that claim will be denied on technical grounds. I just wanna clarify, cause this is an old slide. So, um, so it used to be 1200 and what Andy's saying it is 1310 per month gross for 2021, it's going up to 1350 um, per month for 2022. Um, so if you're kind of taking notes of what that substantial gainful amount, the 1350 is what you need to know for 2022, 1310 for 2021. That's right, that's right. But in this case, you have an impairment related work expense. Okay, not all of a person's gross income is necessarily going to be counted if they have, <clears throat> excuse me, if they have certain expenses associated with their disability. In other words, that that enable them to work. They have to they have to have certain devices or spend money on certain things in order to be able to work. We can subtract those expenses that they have for those items from their gross income. So that means we would count that much less of their gross income. So in this case, a person is earning twelve hundred but they have the medications to, which enable them to work are $75 a month. So we would, so of the original 1200 gross per month, we would only count 1125 under the impairment related work expense. There might be other things. Um, suppose a person uh, can't get to work except by special transportation. There's no public transportation to get to and back uh, to and from work and they need to take Uber because of that's the only way of, their, of them getting to work, we might be able to use that as an impairment related work expense. And if their earnings per month were 1200 gross, but 400 a month was spent for trans, trans, special, special transportation, that means we would only count 800 of the original $1,200 gross. So that's under the impairment related work expense. And there are other things, devices a person might need uh, or that, that the person might need to rent out in order to be able to work. Anything like that would be, that would be subtracted from the gross earnings. That means that would count that much less that anything they would spend for, for an impairment related work expense would not be counted. And here are some Andy, of the can things. you talk, up, talk about, um, so I know we're talking about the the impairment related work experience um, expenses, but what about unearned income and earned income? So earned income is they're they're working a job, but unearned yes. income, like yeah. let's say we're, they're we're getting get an to, annuity get payment. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I just want to make sure you address that. Thank yeah. you. So with impairment related work expenses, these are some of the things that 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 a person could have expenses associated with their their going to work. And that means that if this was approved by Social Security, these expenses 
they could be subtracted from the person's gross monthly income. So that means that much less of their income would be counted. Uh, attended care services, service animals, prosthesis, prescription drugs, transportation costs, and other items and services. Now this would have to be approved by Social Security. Okay, so you would have to contact Social Security and say, well, they have this expense uh, associ associated with their disability. They have to spend this or otherwise they would not be able to work. So that means whatever they have to spend for that item, uh, we would subtract from their gross income, which means there's less of their gross income that we would be counting monthly. Okay. So uh, the this is the form 821. When a person is uh, has expenses associated with their with their disability, okay, uh, or something, there's some kind of special condition that they have, like extra help or fewer hours or more rest periods, uh, they would you would fill out form SSA 821, okay, and this would help this would help Social Security. Um, decide then whether this is an acceptable impairment related work expense or not. Okay, so let's talk about employment supports. When a person, when a person is working or, um, yeah, or has other income, if they're using this for certain things, we won't be, we won't be counting that kind of income. So, so we have, for instance, earned income exclusion, student earned income exclusion, special SSI payments for persons who work. Now, this is referring to the SSI program. Remember, SSI is the check that comes on the first of the month. OK, this is the one that gives you Medicaid. This is the assistance from the federal government. This is not referring to Social Security, to SSDI. So if a person's getting Social Security under their parent, these 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 employment supports would not be applicable. So earned income exclusion means Social Security does not count the first $65 of any income earned from wages. The person is working and you're making $865 a month. Okay, We take $65 from the $865 gross wages. That leaves $800. If they have no other income, besides that work income. Then we take another 20 besides that 65. So that would leave 780. That's the amount of gross income social security would be counting, okay? Now from the 780, we divide that by two, whatever that is. And then that's what we would, that's whatever that is, that would be subtracted from the SSI amount. And that's what the person would receive in SSI benefits. So if they're working and um, if the wages are the only thing that they are earning, the only income that they have coming in, we don't sub we subtract the first $85 of their gross income. If they have other income, then it's the first $65. So, but usually it's usually 85, we take away and then uh, divide by half and that's what's subtracted from the SSI amount. That's what they get in, in SSI benefits. Now, if the person under the person on SSI is under 22 in school full time and working, we have another, another uh, work incentive here called student earned income exclusion. This means if the student is under 22 and working and in school full time, okay, we don't count up to $1,900 of their earned income, of their work income for the year, okay? I'm sorry, for the month, I apologize, for the month. My, my mind is, I don't know where today. So up to $1,900 per month, we don't count, okay? Up to a maximum of 6,000, well, this year, that's that's wrong. Okay, this year, this year, that's seven thousand seven hundred seven seven dollars, seven thousand seven hundred seventy dollars for the year. Okay, so it's gone up a little bit. All right. So this is what this is what we don't count.
from the from the person's um, gross yearly income. Okay, so about the first the first nineteen hundred, and I apologize that that's gone up a little bit this year. I don't I don't have that figure this year, but approximately nineteen hundred. We don't count that. We don't count that. So if if the student is working under twenty two and let's say making $1,500 a month gross, well, we're not counting the first month. 50, uh, let's say it's 1,500 in the next month, but that'll make 3,000. We're still not counting any of their income, so their SSI is not being reduced. The next month, that's four, that's $4,500. We're still not counting that, and, that, and so on and so forth until we reach $7,770 for the year. Then after that, at that point, when they reach that amount, if they reach that amount for the year, then at that point, we would not count the first $65 if they don't have any other kind of income, the first $85, and then whatever is left is divided in half, and that's what's counted against the SSI. Okay, we also have special SSI payments for people who work means that uh, people who people who normally would not be eligible for SSI uh, because of the amount of their income, they still might be able to qualify to receive SSI or at least get uh, at least get um, Medicaid benefits, Medicaid coverage as though they were still on SSI, okay, even though the amount that they're making is too high for them to receive any SSI payments. They would still technically be on the SSI program as long as they keep all the rules of the SSI program. Um, Andy, can we take a pause for a second? I wanna jump back to that um, student earned income exclusion oh, okay. um, because I know personally I've had experience with this with my own child. Um, again, it is basically if they're a full-time student under age 22, regularly in attending school for an individual with disability, a full-time college student is not 12 hours. I believe it's, I believe it's six, but Andy, maybe you can verify that. Well, we have six here eight, eight hours a week. Uh, eight okay, hours it is a week. eight. Yeah. But I think the biggest takeaway is this is absolutely not automatic. You have to call your local social security administration and, um, and request this, you're going to have to show proof of the full time um, of the of, of the students um, school attendance, you're going to have to, you know, get everything submitted uh, properly for this to take place. It's not as simple as just saying that they're, um, they're a student. So just know this, but this is a really, really good way that your student can be earning some money, not having their SSI monthly check reduced while going to school. And again, the window ends, it, it, it ends at age 22, even if school continues past age 22. So I just wanted you to know that you've got to re request this. It, it's, it's definitely not automatic. And um, the, your you know, counselor at the Social Security Administration doesn't know what you know, so they, they don't just offer this up to tell everybody about it. So um, mark that down. Then we also, Andy, while we're here, um, we have a good question. Um, what about student loans? Is that considered income? No, no, it's not. And what about scholarships at the university? If it's paid directly for their education, is that no. considered income? Okay, no, great. unless unless it's uh, for housing. I mean, I may, I believe that may be in a different category. But if it's for tuition and fees, no, it's not countable. Okay, and then the last question that we have here um, is, do bonuses affect their SSI income? What kind of bonus? You mean at, 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 you mean a bonus in their salary? Yeah, if that, because that would be reported as income. Yes, uh, uh, that would be earned income. So that would be reported on their uh on their uh, W-2, I guess, it would be considered as wages, part of their wages. So yes, that would be considered. With, with the SSI program, almost, almost anything is considered income, okay? And uh, it's because the nature of the SSI program, 
it's an assistance program from the federal government. So, so we have to be aware of any kind of monetary assistance that a person is receiving. Now, as I said, in some cases like scholarships and things like that, those are not included. And there's also, for instance, unemployment that was received uh, during the time of COVID. Uh, those are also not, uh, that's also not included with normally we would include, uh, we would count uh, unemployment as unearned income. In other words, income that's not generated from work, that it's not a wage, but that would be counted. But in this case, it's not. So, uh, the, but almost any kind of income is countable. So with the SSI program, you got to make sure if there is any change in income or resources, what you would call assets, you need to let us know because some of these things may be a factor. Now, what I would recommend as far as work activity and the work rules go <clears throat> is something called the red book. So if you go to ssa.gov or socialsecurity.gov, you can get the 2021 issue of work <clears throat> of the red book. And the red book has a summary of, of the work support programs we have under SSI and SSDI, okay? So this is another uh, thing of confusion for parents. Uh, the child may be receiving both benefits, SSI and SSDI. You have to be careful because some of these rules carry or some of these work supports carry over to the other program, others do not. So you have to make sure that, you know, uh, that if, that if, it applies to one, does it apply to the other or not? So because of something that's not counted under SSDI may be counted under SSI. And if it's not reported, then it may result in an overpayment to the person. So um, uh, keep in touch. W what I would say the best way is always, always refer back to the social security website, ssa.gov or socialsecurity.gov. That's where you're going to get the latest information and the most accurate information. Uh, if you do have to notify the office, please try please try to avoid calling the 800 number. <clears throat> uh, the lines or the waiting time to get on, on the phone, to get someone to answer the phone can be as long as two hours. And sometimes people get uh, end up getting cut off. So I would recommend calling your local office. There's still going to be a waiting time but not as long and hopefully it's, uh, you'll be able to talk to someone. We are experiencing an extraordinary amount of phone calls. Uh, yesterday, I read a report that the Southwest office, which handles all of Fort Bend County had 1800 phone calls in a day. And that's typical, okay? So how do 60 people end up, well, not even 60, maybe 40 people end up taking uh, 1800 phone calls. So I know it's frustrating, but social security offices are still closed for most business. So you can do your business with social security by phone or via the internet. Now, if you're going to deal with your local office, which is the best way, go to ssa.gov, scroll down to the blue boxes where it says contact us, click on that, and then scroll down to office locator, put in your zip code, and you will get the social security, I'm sorry, you get, yeah, you get the social security office address, your local social security office, their phone number, and their fax number. The fax number is important because if you're going to fax in like pay stubs and things like that, please fax them in rather than mailing them in. The mail takes a long time. The fax is much quicker. Okay. Andy, um, a couple of things. Um, your slides are showing cut off on our screens. And that, um, and if if you can't fix that, that's actually okay. We will send out a PDF of his slides today, um, so you will get that. One thing that I wanted to mention, um, and and I think you hit on this, but um, someone said a signing bonus. So basically, any earned income bonus or otherwise is going to be counted. But one thing I want you guys to be careful of as it relates to SSI, it's a means-based test, right? Can't have a, they can't have over $2,000 in their name. So if they start working and they have a 401k or a 403b that they're con contributing to, and that account gets over um, $2,000, that they can lose their, their qualification that way as well. So just to be aware of that. 
Um, and I think, I think Andy, that's it. And, and somebody did say SSA because our closed captioning was saying SSH. So again, yes, that website is SSA dot gov social yes. security administration yes. dot gov okay thank okay. you mm -hmm. okay so as i said it's it is possible a person actually in texas could be earning over thirty thousand dollars a year and still be on the still be on the ssi program they wouldn't be getting any checks from ssi but they would be on the medicaid they'd still have the medicaid coverage through ssi Okay, so if you're on this, if you're in the situation where you're, you're, you know, disabled and get a job and you're on SSI and it gets to the point where your SSI checks are reduced to zero, we could still keep you on. Now, there's going to be, there's going to be uh, medical reviews of the case. So it may, it may turn out that uh, if a person is earning a certain amount of money, and uh, and uh, it looks like they can you know uh, earn a substantial amount of money, or uh, then it, we could decide that they no longer meet the definition of disability because disability means that you have something that has lasted or expected to last at least twelve months, a mental or physical disability, and it prevents you from doing substantial work. So if you can show that you can do that substantial work in spite of your disability, well, then we may decide, well, you know, your disability is not impairment for you to your working and earning a decent amount of pay. In that case, you are no longer disabled. So, so we would, we will be doing, even if a person is not reviewing, we do medical reviews every three, five or seven years to see if there's been an improvement in a person's medical condition. Okay. So what if a person gets, what if a person gets off of SSI or the SSI stops because of their earnings? Uh, if there is a change within 12 months, we can, and they're not under the 1619B program that I just mentioned previously, we may be able to, we'll be able to reinstate their application without them having to file for a new SSI, a new SSI claim. Okay. So if it's been, if it's, if it's within the last 12 months, they've been suspended, but something changes, we can send them their checks again. We can reinstate their eligibility uh, without having them having to file a new claim. If it's more than 12 months though, then they would have to file all over again. Okay, we also have special rules for people that are visually impaired. Okay, so certain expenses that a person that is visually impaired, like for a guide dog and machines, maybe perhaps that magnify the, uh, uh, the, the lettering on the application or whatever, uh, all that, whatever the person spends, money for lunches, taxes, things like that, those can be written off. That means that, that, means that, that we would count that much less of the person's gross income for the month. Okay. Now, if a person returns, if a person returns to work or starts working, you need to report changes to social security. Now, here's that 800 number, but there's also a way to, you could report it from your cell phone. And there's other ways that you can also report uh, earnings of, of people who are on disability, who decide or who, who attempt to start work. Because the important thing is you need to keep us informed that the person is working because otherwise they will get, they can get overpaid and that's gonna result in a reduction of their check and you don't want that at all. Okay, so you can report wages to a My Social Security account. Anyone 18 years old or older can have one. Now, if you are the payee for your child my understanding is you can't set up, you cannot set up a My Social Security account for someone else for whom you receive checks. But if you are not their payee, then you can help them set up a My Social Security account. You can call your local office. You can fax the information to Social Security also, or you can use the mobile wage reporting application. Okay. 
And here's the red book that I talked to you about that uh, the 2021 edition is available. And that will tell you about the, uh, uh, the work incentive programs that we have for people with disabilities who want to work. Okay, well, before we get into this part, let me just mention, unfortunately, this slide, this slide presentation doesn't talk about the people who are on SSDI, okay, the people who are getting Social Security under a parent who are 18 years old or older, okay, or people who have earned uh, a certain amount of work credits, okay, so they start to get their own Social Security. All right. And for a young person under 24, all they need is two years, two years of work or or six work credits and they can get their own Social Security. Not a whole not a whole amount, not a whole big amount. OK, usually the Social Security check comes the traditional day that the Social Security would come would be on the third of the month. But otherwise, many people now get their checks on a Wednesday, second, third or fourth Wednesday of the month. The amount of the Social Security, the SSDI, can be any amount depending on how many people are getting that benefit and what the person under whom that benefit is being received, what their earnings were prior to them becoming disabled or passing away or becoming retired. Okay, now with the SSDI program, you get a nine month trial work period, nine month trial work period, meaning that. Anytime you earn under $940 gross per month, we're not counting any of that income. So if a person is getting SSDI and they're, they're working and getting $800 a month from a part-time job, we're not counting any of that. And that will never be counted as long as that gross monthly income is under $940. Now, see, that's different from the SSI program, all right? SSI would count of the $800 gross SSI would count would count everything except the first $65 or the first $85 if they have no other income and then that would be divided in half but there would still be some income that would be counted not so with the SSDI program with SSDI uh it, as long as the income were under $940 that wouldn't be counted at all okay so a person has 9 months in which they can, in which they can, I guess, get their feet wet or whatever. And as long as the income is under $940 gross, we're not counting any of it. Now, anytime they earn over $940 gross, and that's going to be $970 for next, next year per month, anytime their earnings are under $940, then we don't, they're not using up one of their nine-month trial work periods. So let's say that they're earning um twelve hundred dollars a month all right so if they earn twelve hundred dollars a month for nine months straight they've used up their trial work period okay if at the end of the nine months now this is referring to ssdi not ssi if at the end of the nine months they've used up their nine month trial work period if the tenth month they're earning over uh thirteen hundred ten dollars gross per month then their check stop, their SSDI check stops. Okay, so you can see there's a rule. There's the way that it works for SSDI and the way it works for SSI. It's two different things, two sets of rules. So this applies to the SSDI only, the nine month trial work period. And there are other things which we also have. We also have a pass program where uh, a person, maybe if they get $1,000 a month, they're not going to be eligible for SSI and Medicaid because the top SSI amount in, in Texas is $794. So $1,000 a month, we don't count. If it's, if it's not income from, from working, we don't count the first $20. Well, if you don't count the first $20 of $1,000, you have $980. Well, $980 subtracted from the $794, which is the top SSI amount, is a minus figure. So they wouldn't get any SSI. But let's say this person that's getting $1,000 a month from Social Security, maybe under their parent, uh, wants to go to school wants to enroll in U of H, goes there and 
talks with the people and enrolls in school, turns out the tuition and fees are going to be $1,000 a month. They write up what's called the PASS, a plan for achieving self-support. In other words, uh, my vocational goal is to become a teacher. It's going to take me four years. Um, I talk with the people at U of H. The tuition and fees are going to be approximately $1,000 a month. That's submitted to Social Security. If it's approved, then the $1,000 a month they get from SSDI is not counted. Okay. Now they can apply for SSI and possibly be eligible for $794 a month and Medicaid because they're using the $1,000 a month from the SSDI to pay for their tuition education because they have a vocational plan to become a teacher. So presumably at the end of the four years, they won't need SSI or SSDI anymore because they will be, they will be earning a regular salary as a teacher. So that's, that's, again, that's a program we have under the, under the social security, under the SSDI, where, where we wouldn't count uh, many, any, well, much or possibly all of their SSDI income if they're using that to pay for their school. They would also be the same case if a person were working, if a person were working and earning um, uh, $1,500 a month, but was using $1,000 a month for their schooling, then that would leave only 500 that we would count. And uh, if they submitted a plan to Social Security saying that th their goal was to become a teacher and, and it was going to cost their tuition and fees were $1,000 a month, again, of their original 1500 that they were earning per month, we're only going to count 500 we're going to subtract $85 from that. That leaves $415. We divide that in half. That's like $57.50. And $257.50, I'm sorry. And that's what we would count against their SSI. So we have, there are programs for SSDI and programs for SSI. As I said, some carry over to both programs, some do not but go to SSA.gov or socialsecurity.gov and under search. Uh, at the top of the page, type in Red Book, the Red Book, and that will give you the different, it, it will give you this manual online and it'll tell you what uh, what programs we have for people with disabilities. Okay. Andy, can I interrupt you for a second? This is Meredith. Allison was having technical trouble, so I'm stepping in to, to help with some questions. And um, someone has typed in regarding the 1310 per month. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? And does SSI income count against the 1310 limit for SSDI along with earn, in, earned income? No, the 1310 is a substantial gainful activity amount, which is a crazy, that doesn't make any sense. What that means is if when you are applying for benefits, if, you're, if you are working, okay, most people when they apply for disability are not working, but some do, some are working. So if you're working, no matter what your disability, if you're earning over $1,310 gross per month from wages, from a job, then you're, you're engaging in substantial gainful activity. So we're not gonna consider you as being disabled. Now with the SSDI program, if you earn 1310, after you start getting checks, Remember, you have a nine-month trial work period. So if for nine months your earnings are over 1310, we don't care. That's not gonna, but if the 10th month you're still making over 1310, then your checks would be suspended until you get below 1310 gross per month. So we wouldn't be counting the SSI toward that 1310 because what's counted toward the 1310 are gross wages from work activity. Okay, nothing else, not not. SSI or any other income you have, is this income generated from a job, from something that you're doing at work? That's what's count toward that SGA, substantial gainful activity amount, only work activity, only income generated from work activity. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Should I take it from here, Andy? Sure. 
Okay, well, we it's time for us to wrap up. Um, Allison especially wants you to know that she is here for you. She is a wonderful advocate and her team can answer all of those questions you have about planning for your future. Here on the screen are a few things that um, she specifically does. She can talk to you about protecting your future, lifetime care, transition planning, that's such a big one. Um, she's able to talk about ABLE accounts and advocacy. And then if you could forward um, the next slide, Andy, I don't know if you're controlling sure. those. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, here's some other things you might not have thought of taking care of. Um, Allison and her team are experts on all of these items. We're very, very happy to answer your questions. And we'll be sending you an email with a recording and a clickable PDF of today's slides and a, a link to Allison's calendar. That conversation is, is completely free to you. We're just here to answer you, answer your questions and be a support to you. Um, there's another question I see here. Can some of the money, the SSI payment, be deposited in an ABLE account or must it be spent? No, of course, of course it can be uh, it can be deposited in an ABLE account. Yes, the ABLE account can go up to $100,000. Yes, it can. Any money. Now, the, the primary uh, function of the, of the monies from SSI or SSDI, they, they should be used, that money should be used for a person's needs, uh, food, clothing, shelter. After that's all taken care of, if there's extra money left over, of course it can be deposited into an ABLE account. And the ABLE account is that it can be up to $100,000. Now, if it goes over that amount, then uh, we would have to suspend the, the SSI until, it was, until the ABLE account went below $100,000. Okay, and be sure to go to our YouTube channel. We'll have a link in the follow-up email because Allison has done presentations specifically just on the ABLE account and that will answer questions for you as well. Um, can you forward the slide one more time, Andy? Yes. Allison is glad to um, let you know that she has a team of professionals. We all work together to support you and to answer your questions. So we'll be... Um, sending you an email inviting you to make an appointment. Again, Allison's um, sorry that she had some trouble with technology today, but she's so grateful that you took time to come and visit with us and listen to this wonderful content. We so appreciate Andy Hardwick. He's just a rock star in this world. He often doesn't share the fact that he's a parent of a special needs child as well. So he has walked in your shoes. So um, I think we'll end it there and we, oh, actually I see one more question. So this is from Dan. He says, we received a letter stating that June, 2021 has been counted as a trial work month, one mm -hmm. month of the nine month trial period, but our earned income is below the limit established. So we are confused why this is the case. Is there any other reason this happened? No, uh, if, if the earned income uh, in June, I think, is, it, is that the month you said June? Correct, June. Okay. If the earned income was below 940 gross, gross now, not net, if it was, then you should contact Social Security and you could probably fax in the pay stub and just show that it was less than that and it wouldn't be counted. But if it, if it was over 940, it would be counted. That means that there would be eight months left in a trial work period and they don't have to be consequent they don't have to be you know one right after another you could have where a person earns over 940 okay there's one month and then the next two months under 940 and then the following month overnight well okay there's another month of the nine month trial work period that's being used so it's it's that way so anytime the earnings the gross earnings are under 940 uh, it won't be counted toward that nine month trial work period. But the nine month trial work period is only applicable for the SSDI program if the person is getting Social Security. Now, the person is getting SSDI, the Social Security. So the check comes either on the third of the month or on a Wednesday. Okay. They are going to be eligible for Medicare in two years. All right. So if the young person is at least 18, 
and they're on SSDI under their parent, or they start working on their own and then they get a notice from Social Security, please come in to file for Social Security benefits. Uh, after two years, they will be on Medicare. Now, if they're still on the SSI program, uh, they will. it's possible for them to be on Medicare and Medicaid and Medicaid will pay those premiums that are associated with Medicare. So the, the advantage of that is that having Medicare, the, the person will have a wider choice of doctors and clinics and things like that. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, I'm sorry, Melissa was asking if she could ask a question verbally when we're using this webinar rather than the meeting in Zoom, it doesn't work. So I'm really sorry about that. Send, send me, um, give me a call. We want to help you. And, and in our follow-up email, um, I will also include Andy's um, email address. I hope, I don't think you mind too, Andy. No, not at all. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Well, are there any other questions today? I want to make sure everyone has a chance. And Dan is saying, just to confirm, those on concurrent SSI and SSDI, we need to check both limits. <laughs> Yes, you, uh, well, yes, you have to, because there's, like I said, there's rules that apply to SSI, there's rules that apply to SSDI, some of them apply to both programs, so you need to check, because, uh, like I said, if a person is on SSI and SSDI, you might make a mistake, you might say, well, uh, they're earning $900 a month, so they're under the they're under the uh, uh, the SGA they're under the trial work period limit, which is 940. So it's not being counted toward the nine months. Okay, that's fine. So the SSDI is not being reduced at all. It, they they get their regular SSDI check, but the nine the the 900 dollars counts against the SSI. So we, we have to subtract either 65 or $85 from the 900, divide that in two, and then whatever is left is countable against the SSI. It's not gonna be countable against the SSDI, but it will against the SSI. Okay. You know, because again, it's a different rule. It's a different program. Okay. Andy, would you forward one more slide? I should probably end with the okay. contact information for us. Wonderful. Um, I would like to say that you may enjoy exploring our YouTube channel and um, it's got so much content you're going to love. I see someone, Yolanda is asking, um, we're going to email the link for this meeting. That's absolutely correct. It just takes me a few minutes to finish the recording and process it and then I'll be sending you a link so you can watch this whole thing again. And it's such a, a great thing. Um, watch for our emails every month. I send out a blast to anyone who's attended any of our meetings, letting you know of our upcoming meetings. We do two to four of these a week. So there's a ton of great content and we just really wanna include you and not have you miss out. So uh, Meredith, Andy, uh, yes. me, Meredith, if I could say, uh, if anyone wants, if you send an email to Andy, A-N-D-Y, dot hardwick h-a-r-d-w-i-c-k at ssa.gov andy dot hardwick at ssa.gov i'll be glad to send you a powerpoint presentation which is much more extensive and goes into all the different rules that we have under ssi and ssdi okay it's it's a powerpoint that's a lot more um a lot more detailed it's it's kind of difficult in the time frame that we have to explain this and it can be very confusing but i would suggest the red book and i'd be glad to share another powerpoint that i have which which goes into both programs and the work work supports that we have for both programs if you want to send me an email i'll be glad to share that with you okay you. and i'll include that um invitation in the email that i sent Thanks, out of course and Dan is saying he appreciates all the information and support. That's very nice. All right. Well, we thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. We're so honored to have this opportunity to support you in your life. So um, reach out. We're here for you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.